Jennifer, um, in Tlingit, that is how you say thank you. We're on Tlingit Omni of the Akwan and Takukwan people um, in the place that is now known as Juneau. Um, I was born in Southeast Alaska, but my people are from uh, Western Alaska. My dad is in Yupak from um, a village called Unalakli, and my mom is from um, a village that is named for the river called uh, Naknik. Um, according to my friends in Nustuyahak, who are um, fluent Yupik speakers, they said that Naknik means lucky place. They told me that um, even if you're a bum fisherman, if you go to the Naknik, you river you'll you'll catch lots of fish and um i can attest to that being true the naknik is a it's a rich river that's given a lot to my family and um but i love my life in southeast alaska too and um today i i'm gonna do my best to um help you be more familiar with parts of the salmon that maybe you have never even tasted before. Um, I think people get so focused on um, eating really beautiful fillets that um, they don't, they forget about the rest of the fish and fillets are good, um, but there are some other really special parts of the fish that um, I hope you will get to experience someday. A lot of people, when they're you know when they're cleaning their fish, the first thing that they do is they cut off the little fin pieces, um, you know, like it, where these little fins are um, on the belly, and in in the you know closer to the collar, and up here, um, you know, on the back, um, there are little muscle nuggets that are really delicious. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, my and I also just want to kind of uh, give a disclaimer. I I don't consider myself to be a very good fish cutter, but I can cut fish well enough to you know to make good food. But there's some people they spend so much time cutting at, at um, the table, um, cutting fish after fish because they're they're putting up fish for the winter. Their skills are just kind of unreal, and I've never. Um, I've never gotten to that point. I, I just cut one fish at a time as I'm getting ready to, to share it at a gathering or um, you know to cook it for a meal or to maybe can it. And so I don't feel like I have that continual sort of um, practice that makes me really, really skilled and adept. But um, like I said, I, you know, I, I know what I need to know, and hopefully I can teach you a few little tricks that will help you be better fish cutters. Um, and, you know, you know, find all the, the parts of the fish. Like I mentioned the fins, the belly meat, in my opinion, is, is the best part of the meat. And I think the reason that people like to discard it is because the, the fins are attached to it and it makes for a not, you know, super neat looking filet, but the belly meat is really rich in oil and it is with female uh, salmon it, the belly meat is a little bit thinner but um, by no means does it diminish your enjoyment um and then uh there are some collar pieces really close to the head that are rich and then um with the head you can make really flavorful soup or um or stock and uh, same with the backbone. If you um, if you save the backbone and strip it clean with a spoon, a spoon is a really great tool for stripping any of the rib meat that might st still be on your um, you know on your backbone and ribs. Um, if you strip that off, you can do really nice things with that meat, and um, you know such as make um, fish patties or fish burgers fish tacos, um, anything that you would make with, with ground meat, um, you can do with that rib meat. And um, yeah, but I'll, I'll talk through that as we go. Um, and I just, I, again, I want to warn you that the fish that I'm using, it's not the prettiest fish because it's from last season. And um, I hate to say this, one of the fish might even be from a couple years ago because what I like to do, and this is another thing that you may want to try, it's not for everybody. I think a lot of people are really skeptical about it. But when I when I catch a king in my um, red salmon gear, 
I like to just, I'll, I'll pop one gill. The gills are right under the gill plate and you can see that this one is popped. And if you pop just one gill, the, there's still enough blood pressure for the fish to pump its own blood out if if the heart is still beating. And I hope that doesn't sound too brutal to any of you, but if you get as much of the blood out of the fish as possible before you freeze it, and I froze this whole, I cut the belly because I wanted to see if I had eggs or not, because I was hoping to demonstrate how to make ikara um, and separate the roe from the skein for you. But unfortunately I have two males that I'm gonna be working with today. Um, but I'll at least sort of mine through it so you can get an idea of how to do it um, with a tennis racket. But um, yeah, normally what I would do is just leave it, as long as I know that the fish has bled well, um, I'll just leave the fish completely intact and just wrap it with a garbage bag and just freeze it whole, make sure it's laid out flat in my freezer. Uh, so it doesn't take up um, excess room, like if it was bowed. Um, and the skin itself makes a really good wrapper um, for the fish. And it, and it really diminishes um, weight loss from um, dehydration in the freezer. Um, the flesh stays a lot, um, it just stays a lot nicer. It doesn't get frosty. Um, you, um, I'm sure you've seen seen that before where, um, say, if you have a vacuum packed filet that uh, where the seal breaks, it allows for um, frost to accumulate on your um, on the flesh side of your filet. And that sometimes can can um, interfere with the flavor experience because the fish ends up um, absorbing the the flavor of your freezer and you know whatever is in your freezer um so considering the fact that these fish are old they're they're actually in in pretty good shape but what i'm gonna start with is um i like to uh i'm gonna put this down so you can see hopefully the angle is good for you um I like to pull up this fish that, uh, I mean, this fin that is right by the collar and you can kind of feel, feel the gill plate here. This is, you know, like the head underneath the head are the gills that allow the salmon to breathe. There's the gill plate under the gills. And, um, I like to, you know, cut the head off, leaving the, the collar still attached to the head. And then the, the head actually, it makes a good handle so that you're secure as you're cutting um, and, and able to cut away from yourself instead of toward yourself or just have something really firm to hold on to as you're making that cut away. But what I do is I first get as close to this fin as possible and underneath the plate and cut toward the this little section, um, this V in between the two um, collar pieces and gill plates. And then I just take a turn and I um, make sure that my knife is as close to the spine as possible. The um, You know, you can kind of, you can feel it with your knife and you want to bear down on your knife just enough so that your knife stays as close to that spine as possible. And then you just start going down the fish. And, and then you have what will become your filet. And I'll, I'll show you how to clean that up. I, I just leave the guts in. I, I, um, I don't bother pulling the guts out before I, uh, I cut just because I feel like it's kind of an added step that, um, you know, it's not necessary if, if you can just kind of clean it off with your knife. The heart is a nice piece to save and bake with your fillets. If you, if you bake your fillets, um, and it, my daughter, that's one of her favorite parts to eat. So, as I mentioned before, this is a male, um, and this is 
let me see. Yes, this these are the milk sacks. And I myself do not know how to cook them. Maybe once we, you know, we get through through the demonstration part and start talking through some Q&A. Um, if somebody has a recipe for cooking milk, I would love to hear it. Um, it's not something that I was ever taught. No, nobody in my family um, liked eating it. So I really don't know how to use the milk. Um, and then the other organs, I, I'm not really familiar with eating them either, but I would be open to anybody who has suggestions about that. So, um, yeah, it, I'm going to rinse my hands really quickly. And move these guts away. Saving the heart piece for my daughter. And um, getting this bloodline off. And you can just, it's really nice. Um, once you get your fillet off of your fish, you can just use your knife and just kind of scrape that bloodline off really cleanly and easily. If you prefer to um, to pull, to, you know, to gut your fish uh, before you start filleting it, then um, a spoon is is a, also a good tool for cleaning your bloodline. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave it like this for now, and now I'm going to flip the fish over and do the same thing. It's a little bit harder i hope i don't it's, you it's really one thing that i struggle with sometimes is on this side it's a little trickier you know once you've already taken that other side off um it's it's easier to kind of cross the spine but it helps to hold hold onto your fish from the belly bearing down on your knife so that you can hear that the bones in the spine keep lifting your belly and oh i did okay it looks like so now i have two fillets that i'm getting i'm gonna get ready to clean um i'm gonna set this uh this backbone aside for now and then i'll show you how i strip the meat off of the um the backbone with the spoon so um i'm gonna just uh wipe this down a little bit so it's not quite so bloody and slimy. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that I really like to cut on cardboard. Um, I find that it's easier than than cutting on, a, say, a plastic cutting board or a big wooden cutting board. And that way you don't have to worry about um, getting fishy smells out of a cutting board. Um, but the nice thing about cardboard is that it's not slippery the wetness kind of, and um, if you have any residual slime on your salmon, once you thaw it out, um, or if you're dealing with the fresh salmon, it just kind of like, it it will not slide on cardboard. And so it, it's the whole, you, you're just like more, um, a little more secure that way. Um, and cardboard is, it's not hard to find, just make sure it's clean, of course. So um, something, to know uh, too is that it's just it's really nice to pull the pin bones for your guests and you can get um, culinary tweezers or another thing that works really well sorry I forgot to get them out earlier um, bent nose uh, needle nose pliers are really good for pulling the pin bones so the pin bones, if you're not familiar with them, they're in the back, um, you know, right above the midline or between the, the top of the back and the midline. And what you do is you just kind of, you feel along here, the, this, these are actually presenting themselves to me. So I can, once you pull one, you get a sense of the direction that they're coming from and they all lay in the same direction, kind of at an angle and uh, once you pull one, then it's easier to pull the others because you know wh which direction to pull. 
so that they don't break. Um, the spring in these isn't working, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna use my uh, culinary tweezers. It's just it's nice, you know, if you're really wanting to have a kind of a fancy presentation, it's just a really nice thing to pull pull the pin bones out for for your friends um, or family so that they don't have to be dealing with the bones while they're they're eating their dinner. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is that the toward the tail, there there are really no bones to speak of. So that the tail piece is a nice piece to offer kids who um, who you want to have a really good salmon experience. Um, you know, because kids have a tendency to be all like get really wigged out or, or turned off if they have to deal with bones. Um, so it's, yeah, it's good to save the, the tail for, for piece for kids. Um, this is a really small fish. And so the bones are pretty fine. They're, they're kind of hard to find. And there is, there's just so you know, I, um, there's more gapping in this fish than there would be if it was um, if it hadn't been in the freezer for so long. <laughs> but um, yeah, COVID just made it really hard to have gatherings around. I, I like to have have king salmon be kind of like um, the centerpiece of um, of a food gathering um, because they're you know they're just such amazing fish. So here I'm going to show you a technique for getting the belly bones off. To me, I feel like this is something that's optional. You know, it's it's not something that's a make or break when it comes to a home meal. At a fine dining establishment, I think it's, you know, you're not gonna be finding the belly skein on a, on a nice piece of salmon filet. Um, but at home, it's acceptable, especially if you're not really uh, secure in your knife skills and you, you don't want to take a chance that you're going to waste any of the good belly meat by doing this, but let me just show you what I, um, how I take care of the belly bones. Um, hopefully you can see this okay. Um, so there's the skein and then there are these really long, it's what I was referring to before as the, the rib bones. Um, what I do is I start by just getting my knife right underneath one of those bones. And then I just keep going, staying as close to the surface as possible until I get under the next bone. And I usually do three at a time. If you do much more, you run the risk of, of cutting into the meat too much. But if you know your knife is under the, those rib or those belly bones, um, then you just kind of like, you, then you poke your knife to the surface again, and then you cut lightly and as you're pulling up with your knife toward the back and away from the belly and then you grab the those bones that you freed from the belly and you you go the opposite direction sort of holding your bone up i mean your knife up against those bones and then you end up getting four of the rib bones or the belly bones off of there and then you just keep going. You pick up another bone and go to the next one if you can. And so now I'm pull, pulling my knife toward the back. And then I turn around, I grab the ends of those bones and pull my knife toward the belly. So I've, I've freed this filet from, from more of those belly, belly bones. Now, I'm, and you just keep doing that until, until you've gotten all of those belly bones off. And so I'm just going to leave, leave that like that for now. And um, what I have here, uh, I have a bunch of cookie sheets that I've lined with parchment paper. I really like using parchment paper. Aluminum foil works perfectly well, too. Um, 
but uh, I can get a really good deal on parchment paper at Costco. So, so that's what I do. Um, you know, it, and it's, it, you don't have to worry about it burning in high heat. Um, like you would think it holds up really well in high heat. Um, I like to, uh, when I make fillets, um, when I cook fillets, my favorite is uh, to um, to bake them at really high heat. I know it may sound kind of counterintuitive, um, but if you if you cook your salmon at really high heat, what happens is um, when you put it in your oven, um, I like I do I do four fifty. When you put it in your oven, as long as your oven is fully preheated, that heat will kind of um, sear and seal your salmon and it holds the juices in. And I found that if you cook your salmon at too low of a heat in the oven, the juices kind of ooze out as it's cooking. It like it, it's, it lets go of its um, moisture too much. And, and that's what causes um, the salmon to dry out. But, um, yeah, so my mom taught me that method. And then, uh, but timing wise, I never felt like I had a really good target time to focus on. And um, one of the things that really helped me hone in on um, the timing uh, that I like um, for, for uh, when I have salmon is um, the James Beard method, actually. Um, so J the James Beard method is to, to cook your fish so this works for most fish. You cook your fish at 450 degrees. Make sure your oven is fully preheated. Um, when it comes to king salmon, because king salmon is so rich and oily, the only thing I, I do to it is I'll, I'll sprinkle some sea salt on it, just really evenly across the filet, not very thickly, but just very evenly. And, um, and then I, I like to use onion powder onion um, powder, not onion salt, because you don't want to add more salt. You just want to add the kind of this onion dust, because um, onion is such a good compatible flavor with fish, I find, without overpowering it. Garlic has a tendency to maybe um, mask the flavor of your fish if it's a more subtle, subtly flavored fish. Um, but the okay, so the rule of thumb for the timing of it, though, is for every inch of thickness of your fish, like you want to measure the thickest part of your filet. And for every inch of thickness at 450 degrees, you cook your salmon for 10 minutes. And, and then if the salmon is like, if you have a really big king salmon, then, then it's going to be um, a little longer. Um, you just kind of like adjust the ratio or, you know, do, do the math to, to find that ideal time. And of course, if it's a little smaller then then you're going to, um, like this one, I think I'm probably going to try it at nine minutes and see if it's fully cooked. And then also bear in mind that just the heat, the residual heat, even after you take it out of the oven is going to cause it to cook more. Um, it's really easy to overcook fish and kind of have a, like a negative experience. So I think it's, it's better to, you know, if you can um, go easy at first, and then you can always put it back in if you need to for a couple more minutes, if it's not to your liking, if you find it's just a little too raw in the middle. Um, but okay, so let's, let's get back to the, the carcass the backbone and the head. Um, so now I'm going to cut the head off of the frame of the, the salmon. And um, I'm going to use my ulu. This is a Yupik knife. Um, I find that it's, it's easier to use than a, a regular knife because the head is not easy to cut through. And um, cut the, the head in half so that I have mirrored sides of the head. And then um, I'm going to make sure I cut away the gills. There's no good way to eat gills <laughs> that I know of. Um, they're, uh, they're really not good at all. I found if you, you know, like a, I've um, sometimes, you know, little bits of it will 
it, they're kind of hard to get to when you're you're cleaning your fish and um it's just it's really unpleasant biting into a piece of um of gill so now i have the head and then this to me is one of the most treasured pieces of the salmon this is the collar here i'm going to cut it away from the head and it's um I'd recommend that you just leave the fin on because you run the risk of um, exposing this, you know, like the nice um, muscle underneath the fin. Um, and there's there's not a lot of meat here, but the meat is just so good next to the collar that you, you just, you don't wanna miss this. Um, I, you know, I never even really tried uh, the collar until I was well into my twenties and oddly enough, I didn't eat my first collar until I was in a, a Japanese style restaurant. Um, and it was, I had a yellowfin, yellowfin collar. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go home this summer and have, um, do this with salmon. But um, it's wonderful broiled, or you can just bake it with your fillets. When I, when I bake a salmon, I like to have my, my nice fillet cookie sheet and then um uh a cookie sheet that has all the odd bits like the collar pieces the backbone you can bake the head and um you know it, some people like to eat the eye my niece loves it i don't like to eat the eye but i love the cheek there's an amazing piece of meat under the cheek um i don't i don't think i'm gonna I didn't plan on doing a cooking demonstration. I just wanted to show you and talk you talk through the different possibilities tonight. So I, but this class is long enough. I, you know, I just realized that I could preheat an oven and cook some, cook some salmon while we're having a discussion. But at the same time, I realized that might be kind of mean, you know, cause <laughs> you don't get to taste it with me. Um, but but i could like i could break the head apart and just show you the different parts that are really good for eating but if you're not into doing that um you should know that this cutting the head open like this if your intention is to make stock um you know that this is a, a really good way to um you know to the head has all of the richest oil in it. It I know it doesn't look like it would, but it's amazing how much oil um, the cartilage in the head houses. So um, that's something that's really important to keep in mind. And if you do if you do make stock with your head or fish soup, um, you're gonna want to cut the the head down a little bit. Um, you can bake it like this and then break it apart and eat the cartilage. The cartilage is really, I think you would be surprised at how good it tastes. It's just that, um, you know, it's sometimes you have to deal with other bones that come along with it. Um, and I would recommend that you peel the skin off uh, just because the skin on the head, it's really, um, it's kind of, a, it's thickly textured and I don't find it um, additive <laughs> to the flavor. But the things underneath it are really wonderful. Um, and uh, the cartilage, it's a little bit crunchy, but it's really flavorful. And then if you do end up with some of the bones that are right next to it, um, make sure that you chew down on them fully it, it, between your molars. And, and then before you pull them out of your mouth, suck the juice out of those bones because there's just a lot of good, rich, rich flavor that ends up in the um the bones next to the cartilage so um i can i i think what i'll do too is i'll just cut it apart in a way that uh where you'll you'll know how to find the pieces and just how to sort of open it up so that you can um 
uh, get more flavor out of it if you make soup or stock. So I'd recommend that you, you, you cut the jawline off and, and then cut the, the nose off. So that's the upper part. So um, if you cut the nose off, that really opens up a lot of the cartilage so that more of the oil and flavor can be released out of the head if you're making stock. Um, and then bear in mind too, that there's some really delicious muscles behind the, I, I don't like to eat the, the eye itself because it tastes too metallic to me. But the, um, there's some really good muscles behind the eye that look, they look like clam necks. And if you once once that's cooked, if you just pull pull the on the clam necks, they're they're really really delicious to eat. Um, so there's that's the head. Um, if you have more questions about that about um, making um, stock or soup, uh, we can discuss that later. Um, and but I want to get to the the frame back to the frame so there is still some bloodline in here and i think i am i'm going to use this spoon remember i mentioned the spoon is really good for cleaning the the rib meat off of the bones but it's also good for getting this uh the bloodline um off or out of the uh that uh you know off of the the backbone so I hope you can see that. Um, and then if, if you find that there's more that you can't get with a spoon, you can always just clean it on, under your sink uh, with running water. Or if you're working outside and you have a hose, you can spray the last bits of the blood out. You don't want to leave any residual blood on your, um, on your salmon or anything that you're going to cook because you'll end up with a white scum in your soup. Um, sorry if that water was too loud. You'll end up with kind of like a white scum. Um, and it, it'll like add kind of like a, just a bad flavor to your soup too. A weird sort of, uh, just a bad tinge to your soup. Um, so here, I'm going to rinse this a little bit more. Okay, so I'm going to show you another odd bit that I really like, um, and it's the it's the back meat that is above um, it's above the the spine. And what I like to do is I just I get my knife in there, and um, and then just cut down, kind of close. Ooh, I didn't do a very good job there. Um, I lost some of it. Um, well, actually, that was good because it avoided more of the, um, the, the bones from the spine. But this meat right here on the back, it's another really rich band of meat. Um, and this is something you can add to your, you know, just cook it right next to your filet. And you may end up with a few little bones, but... Um, if it's fully cooked, but not overcooked, it's really easy to just pull the skin right off and enjoy this nice, rich meat that's up here um, that you, you can't quite get when you're filleting. Um, so it's that's something not to be missed. Now, what I'm going to do is... Um, strip the hey you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna change cardboard because this this piece of cardboard is getting really kind of funky um so i'm gonna move these these bits over to my uh cookie sheet the pieces that i want to cook or um make stock with and uh and it's, yeah, the beauty of, of using cardboard is you can just um, kind of kind of roll it up. 
and and then fold it up and and then just discard it but then you're going to want to find a place to bring your trash if it's not trash day the next day <laughs> um so now i have another nice piece of cardboard underneath um and let me get my spoon and something to put the meat in and um just turn the spoon upside down so the sharp side of the sharp edge of the spoon is down and then just start start stripping the meat off you can hold hold the the backbone and then just just you'll you'll find that you can just strip right down to the bones and the the cool thing about making your bones so clean is that it sets you up really well for making flavorful soup or stock without the extra flesh that will kind of cause a weird um that weird scum that i was talking about you know the white the whiteness that happens from you know the protein um that you wouldn't find desirable in a you know in a stock in a fish stock um but even if you do end up with that it's not the it's not the worst thing in the world um because you can just you can always just skim it right off the top to clarify your your stock um and yeah just keep collecting it what i've done is if i just have too much fish to eat i'll just i'll save it you know i'll collect my rib meat and then you know, make sure it's sealed up good and, and just stick it in the freezer until I, I want to make something with it. But, um, it's pretty amazing. This, this method, I'm, I'm so glad that somebody showed it to me. They just, they call it spoon meat, which makes sense. You know, if you use a tool or a spoon for your tool to do it. Um, but yeah, this is just a, small fish but i'm i'm ending up with quite a bit quite a bit of this spoon meat um and yeah i i started with the smaller fish because the bigger fish that i have it it just um it wasn't fully thought and I was worried that I wouldn't be able to make a good fillet with it because it's pretty hard to fillet a frozen fish. Um, but so, oh, there's still a little nugget right here that I can get. Um, but as you can see, this is, it's pretty clean. There's, there's really not much meat left on it. And um, I think what I'm going to do before I, I make stock with this um, is uh, just bake it in the oven so it can kind of get roasted. And then I'm going to um, boil it down for stock with the head. So I'm going to just save that for now. Um, and it'll be all already to uh, to make soup or stock with but um i need to i'm going to cut this tail piece off yeah and then so i just i want to give a shout out to my niece rachel because uh she started during the pandemic she started um, making jewelry she started doing a lot of beading and um I found some, um, I was mushroom hunting and I ended up finding some um, salmon bones in the woods, you know, from where a bear had probably dragged the salmon into the woods. And um, they were eaten clean, you know, by bacteria and whatever else nature does, you know, to bleach bones. And um, so I, I sent her the the vertebra pieces and she made me these earrings. So that's another way of fully utilizing your salmon 
except um, I wouldn't recommend just trying to boil the bones down because there's just so much gelatin and oil that all the cooking in the world can't clean as well as nature does. So if you, if there's any way that, you know, like if you're interested in trying to save bones to make jewelry with, if there's a way for you to like leave them out close to the ground where nature can take care of cleaning them, um, I would recommend that you do that above um, trying to uh, cook them, boil them down because uh, Rachel tried to do that so she could make more and um, they apparently they yellowed quite a bit because there was still oil and stuff that just couldn't be released from from cooking. But um, how about shall we talk through some questions right now if people have them? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. And actually, the the one question that we had in the chat was about your earrings. Oh, <laughs> answered that right away. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, what a wonderful story, too, about finding the bones that were left by by um, another creature. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, so I guess, does anybody have any questions? You could put them in the chat. Those Sorry, my hands are so, um, it's oh, hard to, to handle can, the computer. I could read them to you. Sure, that would be great. Okay, yeah, so got a question. Are there any tips on cooking the skin? Um, uh, Mo likes it in hand rolls, but doesn't know how to do it at home. Oh, you know, I've unfortunately, uh, I don't have any hard and fast tips. For me, the skin, it, it's like, um, you know, sometimes it, it just slides right off of the salmon so easily. Um, I, so you're wanting, you're wanting the skin just for crisping and eating or, or for, for, for making hand rolls, you said, like, uh, so you're wanting to like separate the skin from the, the salmon itself and then cook it? Um, no, it's kind of more like I, after I cook the salmon and then I pull the fillet, you know, if I have a fillet and then I eat the fillet and there's the skin left uh -huh. it, and I always save it. Cause I always think I'm going to fry it up and it's going to be so delicious and I'll have salmon bacon. And then I get chicken and I don't do it. Like I get coward. Oh. So yeah. I just wondered if you had any tips. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, you know, I I think I would only be guessing, but that sounds like a great idea. Um, one, I, when when we used to eat smoked fish at my great grandparents' house, my my grandparents had this oil stove, you know, those cast iron oil stoves. And uh, the thing is that that skin is already dried. It's so dried, and then. But we would put it on the cast iron and then it, by the time it curled up tight, we knew it was crispy enough that we could chew through it. If you try to do that with um, dry smoked fish, it's impossible because it's just it's as tough as leather. Um, so I don't know, like I think it might be worth trying to use a, a cast iron skillet and add a little bit of oil, but while also recognizing that the skin itself is going to have its own oil and maybe just experiment with um you know putting the skin side down first and seeing if it like crackles and crisps um and if it seems like the the inside isn't cooked enough then flip it and see see what happens <laughs> you know like that's i think the best advice i could give you but um if you wanted to try to you know like some people just don't like the skin at all so one thing that i could show you for oh, oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> but um it, it might be worth experimenting with maybe just so you'd be less likely to forget it in your leftovers in your fridge um maybe just separating the the skin from the fish before you even cook it and and cook them simultaneously and just see how 
how the skin cooks, you know, what rate it cooks at while the salmon is cooking. It, it might be worth a try. Would it be worthwhile for people to see the way that I separate the skin from, from the, um, the flesh? It's pretty easy, actually. It's easier than filleting. I can just do a quick demo of that. Um, here, I'll I'll just go ahead and do it. So I'm I'm gonna mo move toward the tail, and what I do is I just cut straight down. Oops, I gotta turn my camera down. Sorry. I just cut straight down until I get to the skin, and you don't want to cut through the skin, just to the skin. And then I get my knife as you know, in there and angle the knife and then just start um, moving down the, the skin, sort of rocking your knife back and forth, but keeping it as close to the skin as possible. And ooh, I didn't do that as good as I could have. There's still some skin on the, the, the salmon, but there's, yeah, there's no skin left on the, the fish itself. Um, here, I'm going to just turn it around and do the same thing the other way. Um, I still have the belly bones and the fins on there, so it's a little bit, I don't know how far I'll get on this, but. Um, so now there's another section that is skinned. And then, you know, if you want to try, try experimenting with that, Mo, you can just just keep going until you've stripped the excess flesh off. And that brown layer, you know how there's there's a brown layer between the, the, um, the more brightly colored flesh and the skin. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's like a extra fat layer um, for the, the fish. But um, yeah, just maybe just keep doing doing that until until the skin is clean. Um, and and try crisping it. Ex maybe just have some different experiments with crisping it up in a pan. Um, so yeah, I've just I've never done that. So like I said, I would I would just be guessing, <laughs> but I I think it's worth you know trying a, a cast iron skillet to do that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Were there other questions right now? Yeah. Um, another question that we have is what are the salmon's spine and tail used for? The, you mean in terms of cooking? Not, uh, um, you, mu you must mean in in for, for cooking. Yeah, so the spine, um, I uh, I like to make um, uh, soup with it or, or stock, um, you know, just like you would any kind of bone broth, but it's the, you know, it's the salmon version of bone broth or the, you know, the fish stock version of bone broth. Um, and the tail, you know, I've never really, I usually just cut the tail off because the, um, I feel like the skin maybe isn't the best thing to put in, in the soup. Um, it's, it, but it, you know, like a beautiful tail piece can, can be a nice show, showy kind of thing to have too, you know, if you're having a gathering with a fish as the centerpiece. So, um, you know, if your fish is in really good shape, um, you can, you know, present that along with the filet on a platter and it would be really beautiful. And there is some, some meat, you know, like you can, if you, if you pull the skin up, you'll find some, some good meat in there uh, just a little bit though. You know, once, once the tail fans out, it's, it really is just bone and skin. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. And um, we have another question here of how do you prepare the spoon meat? Okay, so um, good. Uh, I, I think at this point, we've um, transitioned to like, maybe talking more about recipes, but um, 
uh, one other thing that I, I was going to do with the big fish that I have is um, just sort of cut in sections to to give you a sense of like how how you might cut so that you can fit into a jar if you're wanting to preserve your salmon uh, by pressure cooking it. Um, but it, it really is it, it's there's not a whole lot to show there. So I think this would be a good time to start talking through um, just uh, how to approach making different things. Um, so the way that I make uh, with the spoon meat, I think my favorite thing to do is to, to make burgers with it. It really makes spectacular burgers. So I start by just putting, you know, putting the ground meat in a bowl and I, I approach it in the same way that I approach making burgers, you know, homemade burgers. Um, and I, I add an egg because egg is a good binder. I add seasoning, you know, like salt, um, some onion powder. If you want to spice it up, you can always add some, some hot spices. Um, and I, I like to use oats when I make burgers. I, I just kind of just grab a handful of oats and throw them in the bowl with the meat. And because it's like, it's good at sort of managing the moisture and helping the eggs to bind to the, um, to the salmon and, um, and then, you know, you could also add maybe some sauteed onions um, or some sauteed peppers if you like to, to have a, a nice mixture of things. You, you know, you could also put your mind in um, the place of like uh, how you would approach making a crab patty or something if you like making crab patties or even use a crab patty recipe as a reference. But but I have found that the way, you know, this really simple way that I just described, it, it really is, it's really easy and it turns out really well. Um, and I, I just make them in a, um, a nice metal pan, you know, with no, you don't use a pan with Teflon coating. You wanna make sure that you're using either cast iron or um, a nice iron pan with no surface coating and, um, you know, one that you love that that is seasoned well, and um, just put a little bit of olive oil in the pan, or you know, if you want to like make it richer, if you have some bacon grease, just put a little bacon grease in the pan, or, or a little uh, duck fat, and um, and just you know, form your patties, and just make sure your your uh, pan is a little past medium heat, and you know, stick it onto the pan, um, sear it pretty good. Um, it like for, for a few minutes before you, before you flip your patties and then, um, you know, do the other side for, for at least a few minutes. If your pan is hot enough that that should be all it takes, but, um, you can all, all just to make sure that the center is cooked. Um, one thing that I like to do when I'm cooking in a pan is, um, if I know that it's pretty well on its way, then I'll just turn the heat off and then find a tightly fitting lid and sort of let it steam cook the rest of the way. Because I don't know, there's something about steam that kind of like it, it almost like fluffs things up a little bit. Um, especially if you have a little bit of egg in there, um, it's going to want to like lift and hold, you know, like how egg does with cakes. Um, so I hope that that's a good guide for you. <laughs> and, um, yeah, for tacos, you would just, um, you know, take, take the same rib meat and, um, st you know, heat your pan, cook whatever you want for the base of your tacos, you know, like cook every, everything that you want to be in your taco meat before you put your salmon in because like i said before it fish it cooks so fast um and so so make sure that any veggies peppers um anything that you want to be be in your taco mix cook that fully before you put your salmon in and then and you'll see that that's one cool thing about salmon it it visually it like it tells you if it's cooked because the the color changes. So, you know, it ends up being sort of a paler um, pink um, or, you know, it, it pales in its color. Um, 
so you have, a, and especially when it's when it's ground up and loose, when you're you're making a making tacos, you can really see if it's cooked or not visually. And yeah, just remember, just put the put the fish in last so it doesn't get overcooked and and kind of chalky or rubbery. Um, let me see. So I'm so sorry that I don't have. Um, I really wish that I had some eggs so I could demonstrate for you. But um, if you like ikra, the a tennis racket I found is the best way. I've tried other methods. Like there's a way of um, putting it in um, hot water that isn't hot enough to cook and denature the eggs, but it's it's hot enough to shrink the skein away from the eggs. And that makes it a little easier, but um, it's pretty painstaking still. You have to like kind of like gently rub each egg out of the skein if you do it that way. And it's like, I just, I feel like I'm going to lose my mind by the end because I'm just like, <gasps> I can't, ah, I'm not patient enough. And, um, but if you use this, it, it's really surprising how hard you can push and how quickly you can get the eggs separated from the skein. So I'll do my best to describe to you how to do it. So, you know, um, for those of you who maybe don't know what a skein of eggs looks like, it's pretty much like, you know, it's the counterpart to this lobe of milt. They're just, um, except instead of milt, it's eggs. And so maybe that's what I'll do. I'll like pretend this is, this is a skein of eggs. Um, and it's, you know, pretty apparent, you know, what you will easily recognize what the egg skein is. So you, what you would do is you just take the, you take the skein there's, and they come in pairs and there's sort of an open side. There's one side that's more open. And then the, the rest of it is covered, you know, by this, um, like a, this viscera or, you know, a, a skin, a thin skin. So you want to put the eggs, the open egg side down on your racket. And then you, um, you and you want to have something underneath to catch it. What I found is that this rests really well on, say, um, a glass cake pan. Um, and I'd recommend you, you know, not using a metal one because you never quite know how different things that you're going to use will react with metal. Um, so, it, or if you have a glass bowl, make sure there's a there's something. A, a glass container underneath to catch the eggs. And so the open side is down and then you just start rubbing. You, you hold down firmly and you start rubbing the skein in a circular fashion. And then when, when it slows down and you're not getting as many eggs out of the skein because most of the eggs are gone out of the skein, then, um, then what you do is you just, you pick it back up again, you lay it back down, and then you turn the other way while you're pressing down very firmly. And then you can kind of do it again and just keep going until you just, you stop getting eggs out. And then if you find, if you pick up the skein and you find that, um, the, that there's still quite a few eggs left in there and it looks like they're going to release pretty easily, then you can push them out gently by hand. And they're all they they'll come out really easily after you've rubbed them on your your tennis racket. But you want to make sure that you've sterilized it, of course. First, wash it by hand with soap. If you have time to do um, a dishwasher run with it, you know, do that. Um, another thing that you you might be able to find is like a cooling rack that has a grid pattern like this. Um, and um and that'll work too but um yeah it's amazing like i never wanted i'd heard about using this method and i i tried and it just kind of freaked me out you know i was like gosh i'm gonna pop all my eggs i don't want to do that and and so i resisted using that method for a while and then 
I had this opportunity to go to Japan, like as a salmon ambassador and went through a Ikra processing facility uh, where they just did everything by hand. And they, what they had was like this tower, um, you know, it was like a, a frame almost like a picture frame where somebody had strung cotton thread uh, each way, you know, into this grid pattern. And they just had this this guy that was just like rubbing skeins through this this grid pattern. And then they would go uh, down to the next level where they would fall through another grid. And, you know, and then the skein would just be left behind. And after that, I was like, I felt pretty convinced that that was the way to go. And then, so that's the way I do it every time. And it's it's really, really qu quick and easy, super efficient. You're not gonna all, be all like, ah, ah, I'm gonna lose my mind trying to get each and every one of these eggs out of this membrane. Um, it, it just takes like, if you're dealing with one skein pair, you'll ha have it, those skeins clear of eggs in a couple minutes. It's just really fast and efficient. And then what I do is um, then I, I rinse the eggs in a salt bath and um, it's, it, um, yeah, it's just, it's important to have, have a salt bath so you don't change kind of the solidity of the eggs too drastically by using only fresh water. And um, and then sometimes there'll be little pieces of skein left over. And so what you can do is just stir it with your hand. And it's kind of, there's kind of a weird phenomenon that happens where anything that isn't the eggs, if it's like extra bits of skein that happen to get through the racket um, or broken eggs, they will stick to your fingers. It's, it's strange. I don't know why that is, but it, so if you just kind of keep sifting through the eggs and making sure that they're fully separated from each other and, and you pick your hands up and you see little bits of protein on your hands then just just rinse them and then just kind of keep doing that again and and in no time your your eggs will be clean um and then and ready to strain um through a sieve and um so then you just have the eggs and then you you put them in a clean bowl and what i like to do is um i use two parts of tamari i use tamari because i i can't have wheat anymore and soy sauce has wheat in it um but it you know it tastes tamari tastes like soy sauce and so i use two parts of tamari one part of mirin which is a, a cooking wine and one part of sake, and then I add, um, say like a, and then, and you would adjust just depending on um, how many eggs you're processing. And um, I look, and then recently I started adding just uh, like a teaspoon of um, apple cider vinegar to the whole mix, because I feel like that, that gives the whole thing kind of a, the acid gives it a nice bright spike of flavor and kind of lifts everything up. And um, so then you just let it bathe in that that um, liquid. You, you want to make sure that the eggs are fully covered and immersed in in that curing liquid. And you leave it in that liquid for at least four hours before you test it, because you never quite know if any pinworms have if if the salmon has pinworms which is nor totally normal um for for salmon to have pinworms in the belly in their belly and then um the worms will sometimes migrate into the flesh after the salmon dies but they you'd never know they can also migrate into the um into the the egg skein so you want to make sure that they're in that the eggs are in that curing liquid for at least four hours before you um, you test your ikura. Um, and you and what you do too is you run run it through a clean sieve again so that you the excess liquid 
comes off before you put your eggs in um, clean jars. So I, I hope that's helpful. I This is something I've been doing every year now for at least a decade. And, you know, things have kind of changed as, as I've gone along with that. And there are different things you can do. Some people just like to use salt, a salt bath, and that's perfectly fine. But um, it it's important to to wait and and leave the eggs in that bath for at least four hours before sampling them. In, in so that way, the if worms are in there, they they will have had a chance to um, to drown, you know, and um, and that way they won't end up in your body. <laughs> I hope that didn't make anybody too squeamish. Any other questions right now? Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, and so it's um, related to the question about parasites. Um, and that was a fantastic, um, yeah, introduction to the question that Ian has. Can fresh raw salmon be safely consumed? And he did ask about um, parasites or other concerns. So for me, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you can eat it raw, but, um, you know, like if you want to make sushi at home, but I, or if you want to make pokey, but I would recommend that you freeze it for three days before you do that. So that if there are any, um, any parasite or any pinworms in the, the salmon, they will have a chance to die before, before you consume the raw salmon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've seen in other places too that it has to be at a certain temperature, maybe uh, the freezing. Have you heard of that? I have heard that, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to spout the, um, those uh, parameters here, but I bet, I bet it would be really easy to, to just look it up online. Yeah, definitely. Maybe ASME, the Alaska Seafood Marketing. I'm Institute. sure you could find it there. Yeah. So thank you. And then another question of how can one prepare the ikura? Um, oh, you mean like how to eat it? Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe I, I really, I put it on everything. Um, I put it on, you know, like in, in the summer, uh, if I have leftover rice, I'll make a rice bowl with it. Um, if I have a salad, I'll sprinkle it on my salad. Um, if I make eggs in the morning, I'll you know, put eggs on eggs. <laughs> um, or, you know, you can you can make any kind of fancy hors d'oeuvre with it too, you know, just gar garnish anything with it and it's going to make it just look so much more beautiful. Um, or just, you know, like on a piece of toast that you smeared with mayonnaise, just put it on, on top of that. Um, really kind of the sky is the limit when it comes to, to where you can have it just bear in mind that if you do end up choosing to use um the sake recipe that i mentioned just if you overdo it and you're sensitive to alcohol then you know you you might end up feeling that alcohol just a little bit <laughs> if you ha have a lot um or just uh, you want to keep uh, in mind too like it's maybe not the best thing for kids to to consume something that isn't technically cooked, but also, you know, if there's alcohol in there, uh, it's not the best thing to offer little kids to. But if you just use the salt method and you're confident that you're, I mean, well, of course you would be, be confident to, uh, as long as you're, you know, you've handled everything properly, kept it cool as you go, um, then it should be, be safe. But I know recommendations are that kids shouldn't be eating raw raw foods in case they do get parasites. Great, this is all really good to know. Thank you. Uh, related to the Ikura, um, and we have another question after this. Um, after you make the Ikura uh, and you put it in the jar, do you store it in the fridge or do you do things to make it shelf stable? Yeah. 
I, I don't know how to make it. I don't have like a vacuum packer, you know, the, the kind that are like a chest that you like, you close the lid and I, I don't, I, I've never had a chance to uh, experiment with that. But what I do is I, I, I do keep it in the fridge and it, I think all the salt content um, from the tamari and the salt rinse itself um, is a really good preservative. Of course, it's not going to last, last forever in your fridge even. Um, but you, you'll be able to tell, like it, it tells you if you start seeing a white scum on, on the edge of your jar, it, it's, it's done, you know, like go give the Ravens on the beach a treat or something, uh, with it. Um, or, you know, if you pull the lid and it smells foul, like follow your nose, like, and, and don't, don't eat it. Um, but one thing that's really kind of cool, um, it about, you know, like once the eggs are cured, um, you can put them in the freezer to keep and, um, and maybe they're not going to be as turgid as if you hadn't put them in the freezer, but they don't end up popping in the freezer. The salt, there's something about the salt content that helps them withstand freezing temperatures better and not lose all of their cellular structure. So, um, yeah, just, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to put them in the, the freezer. Just, just recognize that they're not going to be as great as, um, if you eat them right away. Well, thank you. And yeah, and I see that Megan has placed in the chat that there, um, according to the cooperative extension, there aren't really safe, there aren't safe tested methods for canning salmon caviar at home. So the fridge and the freezer seem to be the best options. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we have another question about the heart. Um, how uh, do you cook the heart? I just, um, when I, when I cook the heart, um, I just put it, uh, you know, like in the oven with, with all the other parts that I, I bake at that high heat and, and it, it's cooked enough, you know, by uh, just having it in with whatever else I'm, I'm baking, um, you know, with the baking method that I talked about earlier. And then if you, if you make it in soup too, it, it cooks very easily and quickly in soup. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, maybe just lightly season it when I'm, you know, seasoning the rest of the fish before I bake it or, um, or make it in soup. Fantastic. Yeah. These are the questions that we've got in the chat. So. Okay, cool. We made it through. I'm like looking at the chat 24 things. So I wasn't sure if they were all questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I, I was going to pull out this bigger fish and, and just kind of um, show you, like, if you want to can preserve your, your salmon. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to drain it off before I put it on here. See, you can see this one is considerably bigger than the other one, and that's why it took so long to thaw out. But usually when I, you know, when I'm canning, um, what I'll do is just, I'll take the can, I'll, I'll take the jar I'm working with, and you want to make sure that you don't can, uh, you don't fill past this part because with salmon, sometimes it's so firm, you know, um, and that, but it's also, you know, it can be slippery and you never know, like you, you can push it down as far, far as you, you know, you, you're able but sometimes it'll like, you never know if it's going to suck itself back up towards the lid. And if it does, if it touches the lid, you're, you're going to lose your seal. And so that's why it's a, it's a good rule of thumb to make sure you never go past this main rim right here as you're filling. Because sometimes little bones will poke out and push your lid up too and prevent your jar from sealing. So, uh, but what you can do is take your jar 
and um, use it kind of as a measuring device to where, where you're, you need to cut. So I'm going to start right here cut by cutting the tail off. I usually do start from the tail and then go towards, toward the head. Um, and yeah, you want to make sure that your knife is good and sharp because it's not easy cutting, cutting through the bones sometimes. And then in this case, you want to take off any excess fins. That's a little adipose fin. You want to cut the this off while leaving as much of the bone as possible because the cool thing about canning, preserving by canning, is the bones, in, you know, just like if you're making soup or stock, the bones impart so much flavor. So you don't want to cut the bones out of the picture. At least I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and then the neat thing about pressure cooking too is that it, it softens the bones so much to the point where you can chew through them and, and get a really awesome dose of calcium in addition to the flavor of the bones. So that you hold up, you, then you, um, you hold your jar up just to measure go, going up to that rim where you want to stop and then maybe pulling back just a little bit because the the salmon will sort of like sometimes it walks you know it'll like suction itself back up and this tail piece i think it's going to fit pretty good but if it's too wide what you do is then you just sort of cut straight down and then you end up with an angle of fish that um comes off of it so that it'll fit neatly in the jar but the tail piece is actually really small and it fits super neatly and if you don't want to waste any space you can you know you can cut the next the next section to be the right length for your jar and this next section will be too wide to neatly fit inside your jar so then what you can do is just take maybe kind of cut just enough to sort of nest in this bottom section where there's a gap or you know there's no harm in just having extra space in your jar too because this could end up being just a perfect portion for your lunch someday or um you know a, a piece of nice piece of fish to take to work and um or something you know so there's there's no harm in having a little extra space but it's it actually kind of it's it's fun to come up with like how, okay, how am I going to fill the jar? Oh, how pretty is it going to look? You know, because sometimes you can lay things out in a certain way where it just it's like just beautiful how how you see the skin uh, presenting itself um, through the jar. Um, so so that can be kind of a neat thing. I even um, uh, canned some heads because I was super curious to see how well the pressure cooker would cook the heads. And um, it, it, it was really quite nice, actually, because remember when I was talking about making soup earlier, how, you know, if you want to try the cartilage, you're probably going to end up with some bones that you can't chew through. The cartilage, you can totally chew through and swallow it. But if you pressure cook the head, you can, you can eat everything. And it's just really, you know, you'll get a good, good shot of calcium that way. <laughs> Um, if you kind of need it, if you need to enrich your bones. Are there any other questions? Or uh, does anybody, like, has anybody ever cooked the milk? Have you ever done that, Mo? I have not, but I have, ex I've looked in that Alaskan's cooking book a few times and i'm just not brave enough yeah I do. It, it doesn't appeal to me no i've never eaten it either <laughs> i don't know someday maybe i should just so that i can like see see if it's worthwhile and then i'll have s something else to talk through in a cooking demonstration <laughs> well maybe i'll do it this summer and i'll i'll, I'll tell you how it goes 
Well, maybe we can try it together when you're out in Bristol yeah, Bay this year. The best. <laughs> So I, if there aren't any other questions or if people don't want to talk about fish and cooking fish more then I guess we could call it a night. Um, but this has been fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. And um, I'll, where do the fins go before cooking? I usually just leave the, the fins on. Um, you know, unless I'm just really trying to make a super pretty fillet, but um, but I uh, I usually just leave them on because because I I figure you know that there's there's good muscle nuggets under the fin and um so I I just leave them for that added flavor. It's just that you know you do end up having to use your hands sometimes. You know, if you are dealing with those trickier parts with the little nuggets of of um, meat that are associated with the fins and the collars, you know, with the collar, you usually end up, if you want to get every bit out of the collar, um, you're going to have to just pick pick it up and use your hands. And it, it will be sticky. That's the thing about cooked salmon oil. It's, it is sticky, but it's also su just super wonderful and rich. And you just kind of have to, um, except the fact that like your inner caveman gets to come out for for a while you know while you you chew on bones and clear thin pieces from you know the the good meat that you want to eat and hopefully you can find a way of, of being okay with that if that's not usually how you roll Oh, what? Oh, there was a joke. <laughs> oh. oh, it was a joke. Okay, I thought it was an earnest question. Um, oh, the question was earnest, and then we had a um, we had a, a nice, uh, funny answer, so. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It is good to, to uh, wait to eat until after you sauna, though. Oh, is it? I find, you know, I don't, I don't like to go into a steam bath with a full belly. Sauna first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you everybody for um, joining us. If there's any, I guess we have last call for questions. I just, I want to thank Jason Lett for being here. I'm so excited that you came. Um, Jason is like one of the best winemakers in the world. He makes wine in um, Willamette Valley. Um, his his uh, winery is called Irie Vineyards. He's carrying on the work that his father started and his wines are just beautiful and they go perfectly with salmon. It's like they were made to go with salmon, whether you're drinking Jason's white wines or his Pinot Noir, they're, they're like exquisite with salmon. Oh, Melanie, that's very kind. <laughs> Come on down. Let's do a class together. I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so glad that you could join us and everybody could join us. Damon has a question of, do you rinse the salmon fillets before cooking them? I, well, I rinse the salmon really well. You know, I try to, you know, clean any of the excess, um, any of the, the slime that is still on the salmon. Um, you know, there's always kind of, it's amazing how tenacious the salmon slime is, you know, like it takes a lot to, to get it all off, you know, that's their protective coating. And, um, you know, one thing you can do too, is you can take a knife and, um, you know, run, run a knife down. Uh, I'm sorry, is that in the, yeah, I got to move the, or, yeah. Um, you just run a knife, you know, you, you want to have the, you want to drag the, the sharp side and just run a knife down and you'll, you'll see the excess. Wow. I guess I didn't rinse this as well as I could have, because there's still, 
it's like I said, you know, there's it's the slime is pretty tenacious because that that is part of their barrier, you know, between the the world or the the ocean and their insides. So it it doesn't come off easily, but I I try to before I start um, prepping the fish, I try to clean it as as well as I can. But these fish, I you know, I had in water thawing them right up until I did this demo because they they weren't thawing very easily. So uh, otherwise, I think there there wouldn't have been as much residual slime. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you um, sticking it out. This is a pretty long presentation. It went by fast for me, and I, I hope it was um, uh, fun for you and that you'll be able to take some of this into the fishing season. You know, the, the, uh, here in Juneau, the, uh, the season is opening this Sunday on Father's Day. It opens that day every single year. And uh, Bristol Bay is really going to be coming to life pretty soon, too. And I'll, I'll be heading out there a week from today for my fishing season. Um, also, I just want to mention that in the fall, when um, when the deer season um, is happening or early in the deer season, I'm going to um, give another demonstration on how to make bone soup so that you can, you you know, if, if, if you anticipate... Um, hunting this season or um, getting some game from friends who some game meat from friends who do hunt um, you can more fully utilize uh, your catch that way too um, it's it's wonderful this the soups or the stock that you can make with um, with bones from moose caribou or uh, deer and you can always kind of follow along in the demo or apply what you learn to um, you know, if you get some bones from from the grocery store too, so so hopefully you know we can all be together um, for that in September. I think it is it September fifteenth, Jennifer. I, I, it's somewhere around there, but if you registered for this, you'll get you'll get information for registering for that as well. Yeah. Yes, we will definitely um, keep keep you posted on Melanie's next presentation. And I think I think it is September 15th, but we'll confirm that through emails and um, on our Facebook page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is really fantastic. Thank you so much, Melanie, for sharing all of your, your knowledge and your wisdom and, and your skills. This is, yeah, it's been fantastic. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and if you're interested in um, asking any other questions. Uh, we have an email. Let's see, I'll put our email in the chat and I'll also put um, the or organization that Melanie works for in the chat so you can um, contact. So this is um, the email for, for us at the um, Southeast Alaska Watershed Coalition. And then we've got the beautiful Salmon State um, website here. And also um, next week we have a bonus uh, Skillshare with a fisherman hunter blacksmith from Prince of Wales Island, Quinn Abodara, who will be showing, um, doing a demonstration on knife sharpening. So like one of the main things that like to do all of the cool stuff that Melanie showed us, you have to have a super sharp knife. Um, so if you wanna join us, please, uh, please do and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let you know the details on that. And then we'll also send out the link to the recording as well. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Have Melanie. a great night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks for being Melanie. here. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs>